Awesome. All right. Where we're going to pick up today is in the chapter working with others. And depending on how I do for time, uh, which is variable, uh, we should finish the chapter working with others today. Now, um, just so you guys know, I really like studying and, and going through the later chapters. So if we do really well and go really quickly today, which I mean, it's me, so maybe not, uh, we'll probably, we'll possibly get into the chapter two wise. And if not, we'll maybe aim to do that next week. And it's a beautiful experience to study and have a new experience with some of those later chapters. So I hope you'll continue to join us and, and uh, just have a new experience. So where we're picking up is on page 100. And we're at the very, very bottom paragraph where it says, assuming we are spiritually fit. And so again, we're in the chapter, working with others. And this chapter is devoted to the 12th step. And I emphasize this because as we go through this last part of working with others, it's going to give us some directions. It's going to give us some suggestions. It's going to give us some actions. It's going to give us some orientations, ways in which we can show up to situations which are applicable to us being at step 12, actively working the steps, working with others, not so much applicable to I'm brand new. I haven't got a sponsor yet. You know what I'm saying? So that's what I always want to do. And as we get into those later chapters, I find it really important to uh, put into uh, like into uh, into uh, contemporary, like here's what we're talking about, to conceptualize what we're talking about. So bottom of page 100, and, and this is a beautiful, beautiful transition where we transition into the freedom, the deep and powerful freedom that is available and on offer for those of us in 12 step. So it says, assuming we are spiritually fit, and I like to make the joke, bold of you to make that sort of assumption. You know what I'm saying? But assuming we are spiritually fit. Now, if I'm new today or if I'm like, hey, I don't, what does spiritually fit look like? Well, assuming I'm spiritually fit, how do I get into fit spiritual condition? How do I get to that place where, where we're talking about me at the start of this paragraph? And I just want to make very clearly how I get spiritually well is through the 12 steps. Yes, prayer. Yes, meditation. Of course, we want to go to meetings. But how I begin to get spiritually well is the 12 steps. So that gets me from spiritually sick, and I don't mean that in a judgment, spiritually in a lot of pain to at a place where I have recovered. That is the purpose of the 12 steps. So assuming we are spiritually fit, fit so I've worked taking the, the core actions of four through nine. I'm growing in and practicing my 10th step. I'm growing in understanding and effectiveness in my 11th step. I'm following those directions and I'm working with others, assuming I'm here. We can do all sorts of things alcoholics are not supposed to do, which as you guys know, I kind of joke about how sometimes I got a bit of a rebellious streak in the sense that you tell me to do something, I'm gonna do the opposite. You know what I'm saying? Great, we can do things we're not supposed to do. Don't tell me what to do, because I can do it now. You know what I'm saying? Heck yeah. <laughs> and what is also important is uh, to put into context this part of the book. You know, it's it's often interesting. Sometimes we want to put into context things like two wives and uh, see it as like, oh, we got to consider it was written in the 1930s. And I actually find that more help, harmful than helpful in approaching that chapter. But at page 100, at the end of working with others, the context of what we're talking about here is America has just gone through a radical change with which it uh, relates to alcohol and the legalization of alcohol. So in 1933, the 18th Amendment was repealed. And the 18th Amendment, for those of us who don't know or live in Canada, you know what I mean? The 18th Amendment was the amendment, the change to the Constitution that prohibited the sale of alcohol. So it made the sale of alcohol in the United States illegal. And then that was repealed in 1933. And to change the Constitution, I just, well, that's a big deal. Like a Constitution for a country is sort of this like, main governing document. That's a big deal. And uh, if you've ever seen any uh, changes uh, being made, yeah, January 20th to 1933, 
Thank you, Rob. Uh, if you've ever seen any sort of changes to legislation, you know, once that legislation has changed, there's no more argument and everyone's done debating it. Everyone's good and has moved on. So, so the idea of the sale of alcohol being legal and illegal was hotly debated and hotly contested sort of um, topic. And as we get into the bottom of page 100 and top of page 101, a lot of the suggestions were things that were given by prohibitionists. And it's not to say the book was anti-prohibitionist uh, or anything like that. The book really is taking the most neutral state. But we're saying, hey, you don't have to hide it. You, We can have freedom. And so that's the context of what we're talking about here. Hopefully that's interesting. And if not, I apologize. And I'm going to lose you when I go on a Greenland tangent, which I... I'm sorry, I will do. <laughs> All righty, rock and roll. You just bored out of your mind with the amendments uh, and then like losing it when I talk about geography. Totally fair. So assuming we're spiritually fit, we can do all sorts of things alcoholics are not supposed to, to do. People have said, we must not go where liquor is served. Have we had that experience where people said, no, no, you got to avoid it, right? We must not have it in our homes. We must shun friends who drink. We must avoid moving pictures which show drinking scenes. Oh, thank goodness we can watch moving pictures which depict imagery of imbibing upon alcohol. Thank goodness. And it says we must not go into bars. Our friends must hide their bottles. If we go to their houses, we mustn't think or be reminded about alcohol at all. Our experience. And so that's something I want to point out. This, the idea of like, listen, you got to hide the alcohol from the alcoholic. They got to avoid going to bars. We got to uh, make sure they don't go to any whoopee parties. We're going to talk about whoopee parties in a bit. They are not allowed. Absolutely not. No, not okay. Not cool. Hide it from them. That is based on an opinion. And it's, it's safe to say <clears throat> for people who haven't, uh, who have had experience with alcoholics who have not been recovered, that, that is their experience. But our experience, our experience as alcoholics or addicts or compulsive, whatever brings you to this all-inclusive study, our experience shows that this is not necessarily so. So our experience of this idea, like you have to hide alcohol from alcoholics, that's not necessarily our experience. And our experience is radically different from those who have not recovered, who have, and it, for those that are new and just coming to the study for this first time and you're here on recovered, what I want you to know is recovered does not mean cured. Recovered means that the mental obsession has been relieved. The mental obsession is that thought that I have when I'm sober that tells me this time will be different. Nobody will ever know. You know, my problem was I was drinking at whoopee parties, but I can sneak some alcohol into this moving picture. You know, uh, that's a random, obscure mental obsession that I don't think you guys have had. Uh, but that like this time will be different. And that is removed and relieved from us. And that happens as the result of the 12 steps. That's what it means to be recovered. And if I'm recovered, my experience is my sobriety. And this is what we were talking about last week. My sobriety is not contingent on anything outside of myself. It is solely contingent upon my relationship with God, our power, creator, spirit of the universe. So it says, we meet these conditions every day. So we are able, those of us who have recovered at step 12, working step 12, we're able to show up to these conditions where there's alcohol, where there's drinking, where there's Movies that show alcohol we're, or drugs or what have you, we're able to show up to that. And it says an alcoholic who cannot meet them still has an alcoholic mind. And when we, again, when we talk about the alcoholic mind, what we're talking about is the mental obsession. Anytime we refer to the physical component of this illness, we're talking about the physical allergy. That thing that happens is that once I start to drink or use, that thing inside of me sets off and I need more. And the more that I drink, the more I need that next drink, or the more that I use, the more I need that next drug. That's the physical allergy. But when we talk about the alcoholic mind, Again, that is what happens when I am as sober as I am today, but my illness is untreated. And I have that thought that takes me back time and time again. 
to the first drink, first drug, first compulsive action. That's what we're talking about. So if you're writing in your book, and why wouldn't you? It's a whole lot of fun. Write in your book. Um, you can make a little note, alcoholic mind, mental obsession. You see, like I say that, and some of you guys know, it's like grew up with like, don't you write in books? I'm like, let's be rebellious. Let's write those books. Heck yeah. Um, do what you want. Uh, and so, and this is what's interesting when it says he has an alcoholic mind. So I still have the mental obsession. There is something the matter with his spiritual status. And that's telling us what the sole purpose of the 12 steps is. The sole purpose of the 12 steps is to take me from that place of spiritual disconnection to that place of spiritual connection. You see, if that profound sense of emptiness and loneliness and pain that I feel when I'm sober is treated by the presence of God, I don't have that thought that tells me to go back time and time again to the first drink. And so that is why our solution is spiritual in nature. But also, if somebody's relapsing, if somebody's struggling, if somebody's going in and out of this program, it's important to know, like often when somebody relapses, we're always like, oh no, what happened? And we, I talk about this a lot. We talk about this a lot at this study, that it's not what happened. For me to have alcoholism, for me to have this illness, a relapse is inevitable. Step one is the promise that I will relapse. I will relapse. So it's not what happened. It's what didn't happen. I didn't have a spiritual awakening or I didn't grow that spiritual awakening that allowed me to live in that place where the mental obsession was relieved. And so it helps me to go back to causes and conditions. What do I need to do? If I've been relapsing, if I'm struggling, if I, if I feel that relapse, it's coming on. What do I need to do? I need to treat my spiritual status. And how we do that is through the 12 steps. And just because we might have some people that are new and welcome, I'm so glad you're here. I always want to emphasize this. It does not take long to get well. It does not take long to work the steps. It does not take long to recover. It does not take long to go from that place of hopelessness to that place of hope. It does not take long. Now, if you're new, if you're struggling, you might be like, oh, let me do that fourth step real quick. I'm afraid of that fifth step. I hear you. But the more I dive in, before the meeting, we we're talking about momentum. The more I dive in, the more that momentum will carry me. And man, I'm going to feel better quickly. And I didn't want to wait when I was drinking. You know what I mean? I wasn't sipping beers. I was slamming things back. I want instant relief. You know what I mean? As an alcoholic, as an addict, I'm a relief-seeking missile. I kind of live my life by one rule. If it feels good, do it. Do all of it. Do all of it to the extent that it burns my life to the ground. With the exception being step work. Then I'm like, oh, I want to take my time with that. Let me dip my toe in. You know what I mean? That's where we're like, oh, I don't know. I don't want to, let me, let me, you know, no, dive in, go hard, feel better, get freedom. And it says, uh, goes on to say, his only chance for sobriety would be someplace like the Greenland ice cap. And even there, now it's important for, I'm like, this is my like Greenland tangent. The people of uh, Greenland are primarily Inuit, uh, which are the same uh, as the Northern um, people of, of Canada and North America. And uh, so they would use the term Inuit, but also, man, this is, okay. I tried to learn the, uh, you could also use the term uh, Greenlander, but I really tried to learn the Greenlandic term for Greenland before this meeting. Uh, and I tried a whole bunch of different times uh, to, to get it. And it's uh, Kalalit Nanut. And did I nail that pronunciation? I can assure you I did not, uh, despite all my attempts to get that in my brain. Uh, and I just, I love geography and I love learning about different places and, and I love, you know, language and that sort of thing. And, and for any of you guys that are wondering uh, what that, I won't, I won't spell it because I know none of you guys are writing that down. There's a lot of A's, a lot of U's, don't worry about it. Uh, what that means is, uh, that's the name of Greenland, which means the land of the Greenlanders. And uh, Greenland is um, 
it's part of the kingdom. It's an autonomous region, but it's part of the kingdom of Denmark. And if you've ever seen the flag of Greenland, no, I won't screen share it. Uh, but it's got the same colors as, as Denmark, the, the red and white. And it's it's just got an interesting history. Um, and there are there if you're wondering, is there alcoholism in Greenland? Absolutely, there is. And you see, what's the point of this? The point of this like sentence is that like, man, I can't try to avoid my alcoholism, running from my alcoholism or running from my addiction is not a solution. I'm anyone here ever do a geographic? You know what I mean? Anyone here ever move to try to escape the problem? Uh, I went to Lethbridge, uh, which is only helpful for those of you who live in Alberta. Uh, it's just it's got as many alcoholics and drug addicts. It's just windy. It is windy and wouldn't you know i show up and there i am i'm untreated and off i go but uh my uh, so greenland ice cap might turn up with a bottle of scotch and ruin everything yeah it's this like red and did you put in the did you put in the flag of greenland oh you didn't i i was like that would be the you don't have to you don't it's just it's very interesting because it's like it's got the Sorry, I will I will stop myself from going on a very lengthy flag tangent. The amount of self-restraint. If you're wondering if there is a God that can relieve us of the uh, you know need to act on our defects of character, it's happened. I didn't go on a flag tangent too badly. Too badly. I reeled it in. <laughs> All right. So uh might might turn up with a bottle of scotch and ruin everything. So wherever I go, there I am, and I will find whatever it is that I drink or whatever it is that I use. And it says, ask any woman who has sent her husband to distant places on the theory that he would escape the alcohol problem. And I want to be very clear that, you know, there's nothing wrong with going to detox. And there are times it is imperative that we go to detox. There, there's nothing wrong with going to rehab. There's nothing wrong with going to sober living. There's nothing wrong with any of that. But that by itself is not a solution for those of us who have this illness. Because I've only separated myself from the substances. I have not treated what is at root. And that first drink, first drug, first hit, first hoot, first compulsive action is inevitable. I will do it again. So it says, in, in our belief, any scheme of combating alcoholism, which proposes to shield the sick man from temptation, is doomed to failure. So what it's saying is like, hey, just trying to keep alcohol away from the alcoholic or drugs away from the dr drug addict is do. Let me put the flag of Greenland in the chat. Isn't that cool? Sorry, sorry. <laughs> I did. It's I like it's so neat. Okay. Focus. Uh, but uh, thank you, Rob. Thank you for your patience with me. So appreciated. So we're not taking this black and white approach. That's what I'm trying to say. What it's saying is like, hey, that by itself is not a solution. Uh, looks hot pink to me. Uh, you know what? I Just for people who are listening only and aren't watching, uh, or like if, uh, for the, those that are just listening to the recording, you saying it's hot pink, I think is beautiful because it'll get people on a look it up flags tangent. So tangents upon tangents. All right. Um, what it's talking about is that by itself, trying to shield ourselves from temptation is not a solution. And it is doomed to failure. I will drink again. So avoiding my own drink, old drinking buddies, avoiding people, places, and things, avoiding, um, like avoiding that sort of stuff. That is not a solution. That is not a permanent solution. And that's not to say, hey, I'm three days sober. I just went to a meeting that going to a bar is a good place to be, that going and hanging out with our old drinking or using buddies is a good idea. That's that like, hey, let's not approach this in a black and white way. And at this part of the book is where I often find we, we take it as black and white. So again, the context is that, that this, this part of the book is for those who have recovered, those of us who are at step 12 and working step 12. But we can ask ourselves, has this not been our experience? It says if the alcoholic tries to shield himself, he may succeed for a time, but he usually winds up with a bigger explosion than ever. 
Have anyone here ever go to rehab and relapse right out of rehab? Anyone here ever, you know, like go away on a vacation or a retreat and relapse? Heck, maybe it was on the vacation or the retreat. And it, you know what I mean? Like, have we had any of those experiences? And many of us had. So it says, um, we have tried these methods. These attempts to do the impossible have always failed. I just... I just want to like point out that idea of this is impossible. Oftentimes when people are relapsing or people are struggling, for those who do not understand the nature of the illness, it can be easy to say, oh, they didn't want it enough. Oh, they didn't try hard enough. Oh, they must, you know, why didn't you call before you picked up? Why didn't you call before you drank? For an alcoholic, that is impossible. For an addict, that is impossible. If I have this illness, that is impossible. I don't have the ability. I, I, that's really what we're pointing to is a tremendous step one idea. That step one idea that I don't have anything in me of me human power that I can put between me and the next drink or the next drug. There's nothing I got. I am beyond human aid. It is impossible. I need the help of a higher power. So um, it says our rule. So our rule. And anyone ever hear, hey, there's no rules in 12 step. I just found one. Got a rule. Got a rule. Now it's not, it's not like it's not like, hey, but this is this is a guiding principle. This is what it's talking about. Our rule is not to avoid a place where there is drinking. Now, before we get into that, like oftentimes we'll hear it black and white. There are some important caveats, important qualifications that we have to like check off before we can go anywhere. Uh, and this is the first, the first one is that we are at step 12, actively working step 12. What did we kick this off with? Assuming we're spiritually fit. So the first thing is I gotta be at step 12. I gotta be working with others. I gotta be doing my daily actions. You know, the things that allow me to continue to live in that state of grace. And and like, I got to be there. So that's, that's the first part. So our rule is not to avoid a place where there is drinking. If we have a legitimate reason for being there. So that's, that's what we need to see. Do I have a legitimate reason for going to this place where there will be drinking? Is there a legitimate reason? So oftentimes I hear where it's like, it's, oh no, we can't go, there's drinking, or oh, the book says we can go anywhere. We want to con conceptualize it. We want to put it into context. I have recovered and continuing to do the actions that will allow me to stay spiritually fit. And I've got a legitimate reason for going. We're going to talk about what legitimate reasons for going look like. So it says that includes bars. Oh goodness. Nightclubs, dances, receptions, weddings, even plain ordinary whoopee parties. Oh, thank goodness gracious. I know. I was worried that I would not be able to attend a whoopee party. Oh, I'm sorry. I just saw the, I, we have got some shenanigans in the chat and I will absolutely be addressing them. Uh, we got the comment that that flag has, uh, has Tom wondering if it's the land of Pokemon, um, which... At my home group, this is a, quite a tangent. At my home group, instead of handing out chips uh, for sobriety time, we hand out stickers to note denote steps that were taken. You know, so if you do a four step, you can come and you know get a clap and a little sticker for step four. And uh, in my mind, I'm like, oh, gotta catch them all. You know, gotta oh, get all your stickers. You know, uh, so that fits with the Pokemon thing. And then uh, Rob put in the chat, whoopee. So the actual definition means wild celebrations and merrymaking. Therefore, a whoopee party is simply a wild party with an ample supply of liquor. Uh, like a, yeah, like a kegger or like, you know, a house party. And then uh, Scott put in the chat, if Whoopi Goldberg had married Peter Cushing, would she be Whoopi Cushing? It as good. Uh, also, fun fact about Whoopi Goldberg, 
this is, listen, I'm aware this big book study today is, ex is especially unhinged. But do y'all know Who Whoopi Goldberg doesn't have eyebrows? And I shouldn't have said that because now everyone's going to be off Googling Whoopi Go Goldberg. You'll be like, she have eyebrows? She doesn't have eyebrows. Uh, I'm watching all the screens go off like I'm going to, yeah, keep, keep looking at it. So thank goodness we can go to Whoopi parties. So it says, to a person who has had experience with an alcoholic, this may seem like tempting providence, capital P, providence. And what that would be is tempting fate. And Rob's put that in the chat. Yeah, like taking unnecessary risks. And for what we've experienced, right? And for those that love us, for those that have been close to us, seeing how we show up, yeah, it makes sense. That like, hey, that would be an ex unnecessary risk. You maybe shouldn't put the alcoholic near the alcohol or the addict to, you know, near where places there's there's drinking, right? Um, and it says, but it isn't. So this is where we see the gray. It's not that same black and white. So it says, you will note that we made an important qualification. So this is the qualification. Therefore, ask yourself on each occasion. And that's important. Asking myself each time. And often I find that's something that we miss. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm recovered. I can go. It's like, no, no. Ask myself each time. Have I any good social, business, or personal reason for going to this place. Oh goodness, thank you so much. Thanks for coming. Uh, have I any good social business or personal reason for going to this place? Or am I expecting to steal a little vicarious pleasure from the atmosphere of such places? And so what I'm asking myself is what is my orientation? Is my orientation going to see what I could get? or what I could give. That's what it's asking of me, to ask myself. And you know, it's an interesting thing. I, I Often in the rooms we hear, oh, you gotta check our motives. What, we gotta check our motives. And here's my experience as a human being who is an alcoholic and an addict and deeply flawed, and also who works with other alcoholics and addicts. You know where we actually wanna, like where I want to check my motives? It's always with, with spiritual actions. I'm like, oh, I want, oh, gotta check my motives before I make my amends. Oh, gotta check my motives before starting with the new spot. See you. You know where I need to be checking my motives? Before I get into a new relationship? Before I buy that thing that's really out of my price range? <laughs> and right here, before I go to a place where there is drinking. This is one of the few places where it's like, hey, girl. And to be fair, it does not say literally, hey, girl. Uh, but where it says, check your motives. See what your intention is before. And I just find it interesting because I'll work with SWAT season. I'm like, oh, I want to check my motives. I'm like, just take the spiritual action. But it's like, oh, I also got into a relationship. Where was the motive checking before that? And goodness gracious, I get it. I've been there. So it says, if you answer these questions satisfactorily, you need have no apprehension. So there's no need for fear. There's no need for worry. If you can answer this question satisfactorily, you're in a good spot. Go or stay, uh, go or stay away, whichever seems best. So do what you feel is, is right. And you'll notice that there's not any judgment here. A lot of what I talk about in this book is the book meets us where we're at and it takes us where we need to go. So go or stay away, whichever seems best, but be sure you are on solid spiritual ground before you start. And that your motive in going is thoroughly good. So checking that I have a thorough good motive. And then that also that I'm on solid spiritual ground. And again, I, this big book study has been absolutely unhinged ADHD. Um, and also me being like, hey, we hear these things in the rooms. Let's have a second look at them. One of the things that I would hear in the rooms was that my foundation is steps one, two, three. But I need a foundation that is not one, two, three. It is all. And by the way, if you're like, I disagree, you're right, I'm wrong. Although I will say it's fun over here being wrong. We've got Pokemon flags. Uh, <laughs> uh, but that idea of like, for me, my foundation 
It's not steps one, two, three. My foundation for life, my solid spiritual ground has to be, must be, can be nothing less than all 12 steps as a way of life. So my foundation is all 12 steps. And so if I do not have all 12 steps active and working in my life, I might and don't have a foundation. Early on in the book, it talks about half measures availed as nothing, which is rude. It's rude, you know, because like half measures, shouldn't it at least avail me half? You know what I mean? Listen, I'll even take a quarter, you know, like, but no, doing half of this and I will relapse. So by that logic, I need all of this, all of these steps to be active and working in my life. So I have this foundation for life. So it says, um, yeah, be, but be sure you are on solid spiritual ground, all 12 steps before you start and your motive in going is thoroughly good. Now, this, this is just so important. Do not think of what you will get out of the occasion. Think of what you can bring to it. And that is a direction that is so applicable to all areas of my life. Now, I won't ask us to do a show of hands because uh, what I'm going to ask is who here has social anxiety? Uh, and if I ask you to raise your hand, that is just mean and not thoughtful. And no, no, no. Uh, but I will just suppose that I might be the only person here who has struggled with social anxiety. I know, wild thought. Uh, and what I have found is that direction to be the absolute key to social anxiety. And I'm going to tell a little story. And uh, this was a number, oh man, this was a number of years ago. Uh, a friend of mine was having a housewarming party. And it was a 12-step friend of mine who was friends with a bunch of other people in 12-step. And some of their non-12-step friends were also people that were really like, and I don't mean this in a derogatory way. They were really, they had done a lot of therapy. Do you know what I mean? They were really like able to like express themselves and they kind of understood themselves. And we're sitting around at this housewarming party. And everyone at the housewarming party is articulating so eloquently their feelings of social anxiety. Like the one person is like, oh man, you know, sorry, don't mind me. My social anxiety is, is really, really bad right now. And the next one would be like, oh yes, I hear you. Yes, my social anxiety is really bad. I would go around and that. basically I was like, and this was an internal thought. I didn't have this as an external thought because that would be rude. But my internal thought was like, y'all know we're all sitting around worried what people think of us, but none of us are thinking about anyone else. We're busy thinking about what we think People think of us, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Nobody was judging me because they were so afraid that I judged them. I wasn't, you know? And uh, what I have found is that when I show up to any area of life, you know, we can do, we can do showing up to a whoopee party, showing up to a new meeting, showing up to um, a wedding, showing up to a family function, showing up to work, showing up to uh, traffic. If I show up with that lens of what can I get, I am centered upon self. And selfishness, self-centeredness, that is the root of my troubles. But there's something else that happens. When I am centered upon self, I come to the world through this lens of scarcity. So I'm going to use that idea of like going to a new meeting. When I show up to a new meeting and I'm filled with that place of self, I'm showing up, what are people going to think about me? What are, you know, how are they going to treat me? Are they going to be nice to me? Oh, I'm not going to have anyone to talk to. It's going to be awkward. I'm going to be so uncomfortable. And I kind of put out that like awkward, uncomfy energy. I'm a little standoffish and people don't, sometimes people will, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I have a sponsee that calls me ricochet because uh, I'm like all over the place. Yeah. But I will say my tangents are like, they're not like a hard right, but it's a little bit of a loop-de-loop. -loop, you know what I mean? We'll go around. Uh, <laughs> um, but that idea of I go to a meeting and if I focus about what I can get, will you like me? What will you think of my shares? Will anyone talk to me? Man, I, I build this wall between you and me. And I, that fear grows and grows and grows. And I, I'm sure I'm the only one that knows what it's like to hide in a corner while everyone's talking to other people. 
Now that's what happens when I show up through that lens of what can I get? But if I show up to that lens of what can I give that same meeting, that same meeting, nothing in the meeting has changed, but my orientation has changed. And I'm showing up with that lens of who can I help? Who looks uncomfortable? Who looks scared? Who looks like they could use a little bit of kindness, me to come say hi, me to engage them in conversation. You know, when my, when my focus is on what I can give, I'm too busy being connected with God and helping others to worry about what people think about me. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, you know, it, it, it really is like, it really has brought, you know, like meaning and purpose to my life and my ability and my capacity to show up to places where I might be uncomfortable to like, how can I bring comfort? How can I bring understanding? How can I be of service? And one of the things I would often do at my home group uh, is I would create, yeah, I would even put in the chat, pump their tires. Man, that I love is a 10-step direction, but it's so true in any in any part of my life. You know, I was talking about before the meeting how, like, it's been a bit of a tough time for me. And when I experience a tough time because of consistent action, not because of my own innate goodness, but when I experience a hard time, what I try to do is I try to give that which I do not feel that I receive. And I was saying, like, when somebody is especially mean to me, I nowadays have this thing where I'm like, I'm going to be nice to people. You know what I mean? Like, there's something about that. But you know, when I do that, when I pump people's tires, when I lift them up, when I support them, when I encourage them, when I let them know, hey, I'm so happy to, you're here. Man, I want you to know the world is a better place because you're a part of it. Like, stuff like that. The, that feels abundant. Do you know what I mean? It feels abundant. I see that that is around and available for everyone. And I get out of self. And I was talking about, see, I, that's the thing with the tangents is uh, more often than not, I'm a hold of the thread and I can get us back there. I was talking about my home group and I was talking about how one of the things I love to do at my home group is I give myself ninja service. I call it ninja service because it's meant to be stealthy and um because I'm an adult. Uh you know and uh like what that is is like man if there's a newcomer I'm like okay my 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 special mission that I've given to myself is to go talk to that newcomer or to go help put something away or to go let somebody know that man they got called up to the front and shared for the first time I want them to know that they did a good job and I create that little nerve uh ninja service position. And that overcomes that nervousness, that anxiety, and that worry about what people think of me. So that is a beautiful direction that is not just for if I'm going out to a place where there's drinking. It's a beautiful and wonderful suggestion for every, every area of my life. And uh, so it says, think of what you can bring to it. But if you are shaky, and this is one of the things I really emphasize with this book, is it does not guilt us, shame us, condemn us. The book meets us where we're at. So if it, it says, but if you are shaky, it's not like, ew, gross. Ew, gross. You're struggling and you're feeling a little shaky. Yuck. Uh, just turn, the book doesn't turn into like mean girls uh, circa what, 2007, Lindsay Lohan. You know, it's not like, ew, on Wednesdays we wear pink. Uh, it's what it does is it meets us where we're at. If you are shaky, you would better work with another alcoholic instead. So it gives us understanding and the direction on what to do. And again, this that theme throughout the whole book, if I want to get well, if I want to stay well, the most important thing that I can do is go help somebody else. You know, carry this message. Go 12 steps somebody. Go take them through this book. Go take them through this work. And man, that is where it works. I promise. Rob and I talked before the big book study about how, how often I'll come to the big book study. And I'm like, I have a migraine and my back hurts. And I'm so tired and I don't feel well. And then mid, mid big book study, I'm like, woo, good land. Am I right? Like, it really works. Like get out of myself, help somebody else. And it is the most incredible thing to be, to see that miracle occur in the lives of others. It's incredible. And so, yeah, work with, work with another alcoholic, carry this message to another alcoholic, do that. Like give, it's amazing. And it says, why sit with a long face, just, you know, you know, in places where there is drinking, sighing about the good old days. Oh, you know, I used to, you know, 
If it is a happy occasion, and this is what we're talking about, if it is a happy occasion, try to increase the pleasure of those there. So bring that joy, bring that laughter, bring that, I use old time words, I'm like, bring that merriment, <laughs> uh, which is, yeah, I know it's it's weird that in like like two minutes, I'll reference Mean Girls. You go, Glenn Coco. But also, like, why don't we make merriment? Like, the the, the breadth of my vocabulary is wild. Just wild. All right. Um, so try to inc uh, increase the pleasure of those there. If it is a business occasion, go and attend to your business enthusiastically. And the word enthusiasm, its roots are Greek in origin. And enthusiasm is pointing to that idea of being filled with God's spirit. So if it's a business occasion, go, go fill with God's spirit. Go fill, go be filled with that spirit of service. Go help and support. Like that's what we're talking about, right? And it's uh, it, it says, if you are with the person who wants to eat at a bar, by all means, go along. And then that's the freedom that's available. Let your friends know that they are not to change their habits on your account. At a proper time and place, which I love that it has to tell us at a proper time and place, because we as alcohol, doesn't matter if I'm, you know, 14 drinks in and like sloppy and want to overshare, or I've been sober a while and I want to have the classic alcoholic overshare. It's like, hold on, hold on, timing, timing. So at a proper time and place, uh, <laughs> explain to all your friends why alcohol disagrees with you. And if you're wondering, okay, why does, maybe we don't know. Why does alcohol disagree with me? I have a physical allergy. So once I take any alcohol, and for me, I take anything mind altering. So I take drugs, you know, whatever brings you to the study, explain to them the physical allergy. That once I start, there's something in me that sets off and I need more and I can't control the amount that I take. Uh, I was joking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Denny's are high off after the meeting, right? Like we can go anywhere. Uh, and it's, I will tell you that there has been as much spiritual, uh, like spirituality in places like Denny's or IHOP than, than many a church I'm sure you could find. Like there is, God works in those places with a bunch of drunks getting real with each other and getting, getting into the solution. Heck yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, so it's also like, what we're talking about and that physical allergy, you know, explaining to them that once I start, I, I can't stop it. I was joking with this spot C about how, you know, when um, normal folk, I guess they get a little bit of the uh, fuzzy feelings and that's their red light. And uh, for me, instead of a red light, I got a green light with turbo boosters. You know what I'm saying? Like there is something wrong in the wiring. You know, we can, we, so that's what I mean. Like we don't have to explain it super grim or super glum. And many people have alcoholism. Most people have alcoholism somewhere in their friends or family. There are very few people would be unaffected by this illness. So uh, let your friends know that they are not to change their habits on your account at a proper time and place. Explain to all your friends why alcohol disagrees with you. If you do this thoroughly, few people will ask you to drink. Listen, if you would like your television to remain where it is, I cannot, I cannot have any schnapps. Nobody in my life has ever offered me schnapps. Uh, that's weirdly specific. I, no, that's actually not true. Never mind. But it's just that like, no, no, if you would like, if you would like your television, I better not. You know, uh, there's that joke. Uh, there's that joke it, we're in May. It's like, oh, uh, I, I can't take a drink. I've got, you know, I've got plans for Christmas. You know what I'm saying? like oh we get it we get it yeah uh so if you do this thoroughly few people ask you to drink with you while you were drinking you were withdrawing from life little by little and that's an interesting thing we saw that implied on page 18 where it talks about how we have these walls and masks that like when a doctor approaches us, we're not honest. When our family approaches us, whoa, our arms are way out. Now, as we approach these later chapters and dive in and study them, we're going to see this idea that as alcoholics or as addicts or whatever brings us to the study, we have this knack for building up walls and isolating ourselves. But not, not only do I isolate myself, I often isolate my family and my loved ones. So we're going to see that as a theme that's going to carry on into these later chapters. 
All righty. Um, so it says, while you're drinking, you're withdrawing from life little by little. Don't start to withdraw again. Or now you're, sorry, while you were drinking, you were withdrawing from life little by little. Now you're getting back into the social life of this world. Don't start to withdraw again just because your friends drink liquor. And I love this. You guys know in step three, I talk about how we get fired. We get our pink slip fired from the management position of our life. We get a new employment contract. And it's like, okay, I'm going to work for God, agent for God, pew, pew. You know, like, what am I going to do? Double O page, working for God. And, uh, and so the first assignment is house cleaning. Oh, man. So I got to go and I got to clean my house, my spiritual house. I got to do my inventory. And then I approach step six and I'm like, man, can I get a promotion? And it's like, nah, girl, you're over in the willingness department. Oh, and then I get to step eight. You know what? Willingness again. You know, I don't even get out of the willingness department. And then in step 10, I get what appears to be a promotion. It might feel like a little like a promotion where my next job is to grow in effectiveness and understanding. So my job is to grow, grow. I'm in the effectiveness and understanding department, which is effectiveness and understanding of God's will for us. And if you're not sure what God's will is, it's probably the next step, which is like, if you got to make amends, go make that amends. If you, you know, if you got to work with others, go work with others. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's God's will. But now we got, it. we get an added job responsibility. How exciting. Some of you are like, oh no, when, I, when do I get a spiritual sabbatical? You had your quiet hour in between, <laughs> in between five and six, you know, you get, we got our hour of rest. Now back to work. So our job now is to be at the place where you may be of maximum helpfulness to others. My job is maximum helpfulness. Yeah, and Rob put in the chat page 77, our, our real purpose is to fit ourselves, to be of maximum service to people, to God and to people about us. That is our job. And I want you to know, whenever we take these spiritual actions, whenever we work with others, whenever we make an amends, whenever we do our daily prayer, our daily meditation, daily evening review, that is a continuation and the promise that we made in step three. We're fulfilling the act, the promise that we made in the third step to dive into this work. So it says, uh, so never hesitate to go anywhere if you can be helpful. And I always want to emphasize helpful. Uh, we got, by the way, we got preferences. Uh, some people would prefer Denny's to IHOP. Fair enough. Y'all remember Humpty's? That's just for the Canadians. Uh, that was good. They had good pierogies. Uh, sorry, in the chat, they're having discussions about which is the place to go for after the meeting. Uh, we can go anywhere. Freedom. We can, we can go to IHOP, Denny's, uh, Boston Pizza, anywhere. Oh, Whataburger. If you're in Texas, it's Whataburger uh anywhere all right so uh a <laughs> uh, maximum help with this other so never hesitate to go anywhere if you can be helpful and what we're really seeing is we talk about working with others we talk about helpful we talk about useful we're not talking about fixing or managing or saving and for somebody that's codependent like me that's an important distinction my sponsor and i have this joke like if you guys remember the incredibles that edna mode where it's like no capes that I can't put on my cape and be ba -ba -da -boo, super page here to help. You're here to fix, here to save, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's a Zoom meeting. You guys could order in, get your Uber Eats, get your, get your uh, skip the dishes in Canada. The after meeting, it's going to be lit. All righty. Lit like our spiritual condition. We're on fire for working with others. <laughs> some, some of you guys are like, oh, man, it's bad when you put things in the chat. She just goes, yeah. So you should not hesitate to visit the most sordid spot on earth on such an errand. So if my errand is to go be of help to others, if my errand is to do what I believe God's will is to, to be, to be of service to others, I can go anywhere, anywhere. I was working with a sponsee who lived in New Jersey and, and, we're, and uh, we were like, we got off on a tangent. I know, shocking. Uh, and we were like, what's the most sordid spot in New Jersey? So we looked it up and it turns out it was Camden. Uh, so you can go anywhere, even Camden, New Jersey, or even the most sordid spot in your hometown on the errand of being of service to others. You know what I mean? And it says um, on such an errand, keep on the firing line of life with those motives and God 
will keep you unharmed. Absolutely, that is a promise. Who keeps me sober? It's God. The 12 steps get me to God. God keeps me sober. And I love that it talks about keep on the firing line of life. In the doctor's opinion on page XXVIII, Dr. Silkworth, he's it's right before the cycle, Dr. Silkworth, he's getting a little defensive. And he's like, hey, if you think I'm a little full of like craziness for encouraging them, you do my job. You stand on the firing line. And here we are on the firing lines of life, helping others. And with these motives, and God does it. God does it. Keeps us unharmed. God keeps me sober. The steps get me to God. Many of us keep liquor in our homes. We often need it to carry green recruits through a severe hangover. Some of us, and some of, like, some of this is important to remember, this was before there were like safety nets for people or detoxes to, or hospitals that would take alcoholics. So they would have to detox them at home. I wouldn't recommend that uh, just because detoxing off of alcohol especially can, can be fatal. So it says, some of us still serve it to our friends, provided they're not alcoholic. But some of us think we should not serve liquor to anyone. We never argue this question because that was a question that was being argued in sort of the, the, the society in the United States at that time. So we're saying, hey, we're not arguing that. We feel that each family in the light of their own circumstances ought to decide for themselves. We are careful never to show intolerance or hatred of drinking as an institution. Experience shows that such an attitude is not helpful to anyone. So it's important to it's important to see that that idea of um, you know intolerance or hatred that was a real thing that we saw in the 1930s in that time where that prohibition versus non-prohibition was really argued and alcohol is bad and alcohol is evil and we don't see that so much in 2024. Um, but I will say, as a former smoker, uh, where we do often see that is with ex-smokers. And I am blessed that I, I don't consider myself an ex-smoker uh, because God absolutely separated me from nicotine. I didn't do it. It is a miracle that I did not earn. I did not deserve it. It is a power greater than myself. But back when I was smoking and then I switched to vaping because I'm an adult and I like it when my nicotine would taste like candy and fruit. Um, you know, it's like, oh, I'm so tough. It's like, oh, strawberry muffins. Uh, you know, uh, and, the, you know, I'd be outside of meeting smoking a cigarette like a good old AA or 12 step member. And, uh, and uh, you know, people are like, oh, that'll kill you. Ew, it smells so bad. Oh, so that never encouraged me to smoke or to stop smoking. And there are oftentimes I'd be a little passive aggressive. I know, shocker. And when they say that'll kill you, I would non-spiritually take a real long haul of my cigarette and be like, here's hoping, which is not cool, which is absolutely passive aggressive, which is my bad. But trying to force people to do things does not work. And that's what it's saying. Guilting, shaming, that doesn't work. And we're going to pick that up next. Yeah, but not today. Uh, we're going to pick that up next week as we get into the chapter two wives so it says experience shows that such an attitude is not that such an attitude is not helpful to anyone every new alcoholic looks for the spirit among us and is immensely relieved when he finds that we are not witch burners we're not like oh that's bad it's like yeah if you want to get sober i'm here to help you know and it says a spirit of intolerance might repel alcoholics whose lives could not have who whose lives could have been saved had it not been for such stupidity it's important for me to remember of course this is talking about intolerance of alcohol intolerance of you know substances but it's important for me to remember that my intolerances in general can prevent people from getting well and it says we do not we would not do even the cause of temperate temperate is like you know normal drinking never met her, don't know what she's like, uh, but temperate drinking, any good. For not one drinker in a thousand likes to be told anything about alcohol by one who hates it. Anyone really, yeah, don't, don't, get off my back. I was gonna say, get off my back, Glenda. I don't know who Glenda is. I'm sure she's lovely. <laughs> Someday, we hope that Alcoholics Anonymous will help the public to a better realization of the gravity, which is to say severity, 
of the alcoholic problem, but we shall be of little use. So we won't be of use to others. Again, we're called to be of use to others. Not fix, not manage, not safe, but use. If our attitude is one of bitterness or hostility, drinkers will not stand for it. I want, you know, when somebody who's bad, it's like, don't tell me what to do. After all, our problems were of our own making. Rude. Just rude and accurate. I mean, but at this point in the book, we're like, yeah, okay. Yeah, fair. You know, after all, our problems were of our own making. Bottles were only a symbol. Besides, we have stopped fighting anybody or anything. A little callback to our step 10 promises. Yeah, we have to. And so we'll leave it there. And I hope you'll join us next week as we kick off Two Wives. And, and we're going to have a radical experience with that chapter. So I'll stop the recording and we can unmute. And, and then we can go to a uh, virtual Denny's and have a virtual IHOP after the meeting. Uh, not, not affiliated, not affiliated with those restaurants. All right, let me stop the recording. <laughs>